or the, the kids can go to the kids' ministry, ages two to six. Okay, morning. Who handed it? How is it going? How do you say it in German? Who say? Wie geht's du? Oh. Okay. Almost sounds like Shatem or something. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I greet you all. And um, yeah, as you all know, or most of you know, we've been on this journey of um, breaking free from the spirit of poverty. Right? It's, it, um, it has been an interesting journey. And... I know from the start the Lord said to me at one stage, you will, you will speak about the spirit of the Father, or about Father-centeredness. And um, we ended up coming into the doctrine of Christ, okay, which was a very exciting uh, part of the message for me personally. I don't know for you, but the doctrine of Christ or Christ has always been close to my heart. Right? It has always been something that is near to me. Whenever I go into that subject, then, then there's a lot of joy in sharing those messages. There are other messages that we share that is necessary. Um, we can't, uh, what's the word, go away from them or neglect them. They have to be shared. But as we all know that the gospel has its focus in Christ and on Christ. Amen. And so he's the one that he's the one that gives us joy. Joy no matter what we face. Right? So today we are continuing with this one. I think it's session 11. And um, I've subtitled it um, dealing with Amalek. Okay? Okay. Now tell the person next to you, Amalek. You can speak in tongues also. <laughs> you know, if it's a, if it's a tongue twister. <laughs> right. Anyway. I, you know, it's, when I preach, it's the only time I make jokes. <laughs> um, anyway. Ex uh, let's read Exodus 17, Exodus 17 and verses 1, we have been praying f uh, this week concerning, you know, that um, y you, some resistance that we are finding and, and um, you know, our journey forward um, as we journey with the Lord, it always requires us to um, to sometimes face enemies that we have to deal with, right? Um, if you were at the apostolic table that, that we had, I spoke about the, the faith of our forefathers and that uh, if we find the faith of our forefathers, and in this case, for example, Abraham, Abraham is a forefather of ours and Abraham is in the New Testament called the father of the faith, right? Abraham is the father of the faith. And the Lord said to me that when you find uh, or when you rediscover your faith, then you will rediscover your destination and your, your finish um, in Christ. And one of the things that I said was that perhaps we can just read it quickly before I read Exodus, uh, book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. This is from verses 10. Hebrews 11 verses 10. It says, for he looked, for he waited, 
waited, looked, searched for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, right? And so God is a builder and a maker, a designer of a city, right? It's called the city of the living God, right? So uh, Abraham, when he left, he was, he was searching for a place, and that place um, was obviously Canaan that God led him to, but then in Canaan, he, he was also looking for a city. But he was not really looking for a physical one. He was looking more for one that is in the heavens, right? Verse, let's read verses 14. Okay, I'll bring this into context now. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, right? And in mine it says they seek a country. Verses 15. And truly if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned, right? So when you are constantly th thinking or... Uh, yeah, when you are constantly thinking about the place from which you came out from, the world, when it's on your mind, right? You create an opportunity to go back to the world. That's why you're the first place where the battle is taking place is in your mind, right? The first place that you are fighting or the battleground is in the mind because if the enemy can get you to be mindful or think about where you came from, then he can create the opportunity for you to return, right? So that's why the constant um, renewing of our minds. But it says here that, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Verse 16 but now they desire a better. So they weren't thinking about where they came from. They were thinking about where they are going to. Okay? And then it says, that is a heavenly country. So Abraham was not looking for a physical country or physical land, which in his time was Canaan. So Canaan is not... For us in the New Testament, Canaan is a picture of a heavenly place, a heavenly land, the heavenlies, right? Okay, are you all with me? Canaan is a picture of the heavenlies. It says, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them, right? So, so now you must have this picture in your mind. Israel came out of Egypt which is a picture of the world, right? And then it is passing through the wilderness on its way to the, to the land of Canaan, which is the promised land. But according to the New Testament writer, that Canaan, for us, if we're coming out of the world, which means we are saved, we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we've let the Lamb come into our house, right? We have passed over from death to life, right? Uh, and we are saved and we've exited Egypt, right? But we are passing through a place so that we can, so that we can ultimately possess a place that God has always had for us, right? And the promised land is a picture of us going in, journeying into the fullness of what God has for us. Okay? Are you all with me on that? The picture. Egypt, wilderness, Canaan. Canaan is, the, is a picture of a heavenly country for us. Right? That's why there is a heavenly Jerusalem. A city. Right? A, a city that's in the realm of the spirit. Okay? Are you all with me? Okay. So... So when we read Exodus 17, right, they are in the wilderness and we are, and they came out 
of Egypt and they journeying towards a place. In our journeys with the Lord corporately, together we've come to certain spots, places. And at these places we fight certain uh, battles, right? Because if you, if you, if you understand that, that Canaan is a, is a place that is a picture of the heavenlies. And in that place, in the heavenly realms, they fought battles. A picture. Because when they went physically over the river Jordan, they fought battles to possess. And, and this is why the scripture says uh, in Psalm 110 verse 1, Then the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So our place of entering into our fullness is not without enemies that must be made our footstool, right? And the word footstool, it means a step. So when you take a step, if I'm here and I take a step, I ascend. If I take another step, I ascend. So every time I conquer my enemy, I take a step upward. Because my enemy is designed to keep me down so that I don't journey f- more into the fullness of Christ. So I face enemies, but God says your enemy you must use as a footstool. Amen. That means your enemy you must use as a step. As you put him under your feet, you step upward and you journey upward into Christ, right? So, and you increase. So he is just the one that's building your muscles, right? He's the one that is helping you to increase in the stature. Are you all with me? So the word footstool actually means simply just to take a step or to put something under you. In other words, your enemy is actually your step upward, right? And so all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And guess what Psalm 110 verse 1 says? It says, then the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It shows you the intent of God, the will of God. The will of God is that your enemy must be under your feet. The will of God is that you would conquer your enemy. The will of God is that no enemy that you face must overcome you, you must simply use him as a footstool, something to go higher into Christ, grow into the measure of Christ. So, and, and where, do, where do principalities and powers dwell? They dwell in the heavenlies. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness that is in high places. Right? And rulers of the darkness of this world. Okay? So, in short, so our journey, our journey, if you are going to grow, if you are not going to grow, your, your, your journey is not a journey of facing enemies. Because as you journey, you face new enemies that you must bring under you. Right? So tell the person next to you, your enemy is your footstool. You must use him to ascend. Okay? But if your enemy conquers you, then you don't grow in him. Right? If your enemy conquers you, then you do not grow in him. Right? And Paul says this, he says, we are not ignorant of the devices, the schemes of the enemy. So at times we have to focus upon what the enemy is doing. And so today we're going to look at Amalek. Okay? Exodus 17 verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin. Okay? according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Okay, so here you can see the the whole congregation, the people, they were now journeying forward. 
About two and a half, three months ago, I, I made an announcement that for us as a house, our, our, the phase of this house has changed. We are stepping into a, a different position in the spirit for us, right? And, and we are now journeying to, into a different reality for all of us as a, as a family, okay? Are you all with me on that? So I, I mentioned and I said that to you. And one of, the, one of the things that happened when we made that announcement, right, it was not only that, okay, we have come now to this place and so on, but that immediately also does, you know, bring certain resistance with it. I can remember in 2014 when Sean, the prophet, he prophesied and said, you know, this is your time of increase and so on. And after that, I had so much resistance that it was one thing upon another, all right? Only uh, it took me four years down the road to, to come to that breakthrough, right? So not every prophecy or statement that we make, you are just left to grow. Are you all with me? Okay. That's why your number one pursuit in Christ must be to grow in Christ. Your number one goal. Right? All the other things are add-ons. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added. Your number one goal is growth in Christ, His kingdom. Right? The other things are add-ons. Okay? There are things that he would add. So the, the children of Israel journeyed, but in their journey they came to a place called Rephidim. Rephidim means rest. Okay? They were to rest, but they were taken out of their rest because there was no water for them to drink. There was no provision. But let's read verses. Which one is it? Verses... Um, Verses 8, uh, 17 and verses 8. Okay, it says, the, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. The other translation says, Then Amalek came, right, and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Right, so Rephidim in the spirit is a spiritual location. Right, you got to understand it like that. Remember, Canaan is a spiritual location, it's a heavenly place, right? It's a heavenly country. Here, our journey towards is our journey in spiritual locations. As we come into spiritual locations, there are certain things that we would face, right, that we would have to overcome, right. And here it says, now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Okay, and let's read, let's read here. So this, verse 9, and Moses said unto Joshua, choose out you men, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod, with the rod in my, the rod of God in my hand. Right, so we want to know what is Amalek. What does this symbolize? So one of the meanings, if you are writing, the one of the meanings for the word Amalek is to dwell in the valley. Okay, let's Numbers 14 and 25. Numbers 14 and 25. So we read that Amalek came against the people of God, but we don't... It doesn't really explain Amalek to us. So we have to look through the scriptures to find what the scripture says. Okay? Do you have their numbers? 1425. Okay? Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. The word for valley there means depression. Okay? In other words, the Amalekites, they dwell in this place where people are struggling with depression, where people are struggling. Obviously, depression comes from certain things that we face. You know, we have certain personal issues. 
but they also play part in bringing depression to people, right? The Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. One of the other meanings for this word Amalekite, it means to exhaust, to lick up, to lick up your energy, right? In other words, this, this spirit makes you tired, right? And how does it make you tired? By giving you one problem after another. One problem finishes, then the next one starts. You deal with one thing, then the next thing happens. It makes you tired, it, it exhausts you, it, it takes away all your energy, right? Another meaning for the word Amalekite is strangler of the people, right? So to strangle is to take the breath out of you. And this is where you, find, you may find it difficult to pray, you may find it difficult to spend time with the Lord and you find difficult to find the life of God that is there, that is available because this spirit finds a way of strangling that life out of you. And how many of you know that when your life is being strangled is because there are so many things that you think of. Have you ever tried to pray when you have facing huge challenges? Anybody try to pray when you're facing huge challenges and you're trying to, and you do your normal routine, here I pray, see, Lord, I bless your name. And the more you do it, the more you're like, this is a waste of time. <laughs> this I don't want to do because there is no life here. There's nothing. Why? Because, because in my mind, I am too dominated by the thought of the challenges and the struggles that I face. They, it's too much in my face. It's too much in my mind. I can't focus on anything else. Therefore, for me to praise God and to say, Hallelujah, bless your name, as my swarsak, right? It's a heavy burden, right? And depression is also a heaviness, right? It's a, it's a place, and, and Amalek likes to in this place. Right, he that's where he is to attack you more and more. So, this, this word for Amalekite means a, a strangler of the people, suffocate the breath, the life, take it away from you. Another thing about the spirit of Amalek is that it has it attacks stragglers or those who lag behind. Let's read Deuteronomy 25, verses 17. To 18 Deuteronomy 25 verses 17 to 18 right it says here and here the Lord is speaking and he says and Deuteronomy means to repeat the, the book of Deuteronomy is a repeat of what God already said right because they are bound to just cross over and he says remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt okay next one how he met you on the way and attacked you and attacked your rear ranks, all right? Another translation, attacked you from behind. Another translation says, attacked all the stragglers. Now, this is what happened in Exodus 17. In Exodus 17, all we read is that an Amal Amalek, Amalek fought against them. And that's all we read and then we see how they deal with it, but we don't read how they do it, what they did, what is their strategy, and all that. But here, it, here God gives us an insight and says, they met you on your way as you were journeying in Christ, as you were moving forward, and you came to a certain location. They met you there. And what they did is they attacked you. And where did they attack? They attacked the rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear and when you were tired and weary and did not, and, they, and he did not fear God, right? So this, so when we, when we say, let's move, let's do, let's go, this is what God is saying. And then, and then there, are, there are people who sometimes, you know, take long to react, uh, are not quick to hear and obey, Right? And, and the, as we heard this morning from the, the opening scripture, right? It's more blessed to hear and keep 
the word, right? It's not the hearing in the word that changes your life. It is the, it is the obedience to the word that has any power in it to transform. Honor your father and your mother that it may go well with you. It is in the practice of honoring your father and your mother that it will go well with you. You, regardless of what they, how they are and, and all that, you still need to honor so that it may go well with you. So, so it's in the practice and the stragglers are those when, when we are journeying, they are lagging behind. They are becoming, why are they lagging behind? Because they are tired and they are weary, right? And so... We, we sometimes in our journey, this spirit, Amalek, attacks, right? He, this family or this group of people, he attacks them where people are lagging behind, right? Are not quick to respond. The, the life of the word is in the quickness to obey, right? When you, Jesus says this, he says, while you have the light, walk in the light, Right? Lest darkness come upon you. So if you want to remain in the life and the strength of the word that it's able to impart, you have to learn how to hear, feel that fresh, that revelation, that life, and then walk in it. Right? The obedience imparts grace. Right? The obedience brings something to it. So it's not always about hearing, right? It's about also doing and obeying because in there, there is strength, right? And many times when we, when we um, have, you know, this place of, of just hearing but not doing, then it becomes a struggle for us. And who are the people who also get tired? If you remember, remember um, Lynn's dream right in the beginning when we said the phase has changed and we are now journeying and we're going to be doing this. Then she had the dream of we're in the bus or she comes to a stop and there's the bus and everybody must get into the bus. But there's a house and in the house, everybody is eating, enjoying themselves but they are not so concerned with getting in the bus. And she wanted to, she almost missed the bus because she was trying to tell the people, get into the bus. Because this bus was, there is a phase, we are journeying, we are moving, right? And so sometimes when things are said, we don't pay attention the way we should pay attention because we are distracted with other things. And in doing that, we get we become stragglers and people that are, in a sense, left behind. And then we are vulnerable to the attack, right? So, um, it says, and when they were tired, who, who are those who become tired? Are also those who go through difficulties, right? For you remember Hebrews chapter 12. Was it last week? I said it. Was it last week? Which is the one with the scissors? The week before that, Right? The, the, just go like this to somebody. Maybe it might just refresh us. Right? The, the scissors where, where he prunes. Right? But the pruning is painful. The pruning is difficult. But this in the Hebrew chapter 12, it says, lift up your hands. Right? The hands that become weak. Do not become weary. Do not become faint-hearted. Do not become tired because of the pruning and the difficulty that you experience, right? And, and so those who become tired and weary is because the journey takes a lot out of us, right? It takes a lot out of us. Uh, that word for tired in the other translation is used the word feeble. It means unsteady. Now, I've said this before. I've said this before. Um, someone once asked me a long time ago, they said, Yo, my spiritual walk, one time it's up here, and the next minute it's down there, then it's up here, then it's down here, then it's up there, then I'm on a high, then I'm on a low, and so on. 
And I just can't, and I'm, so that's like being unsteady. But then I said, if you want to be steady, stable, you must learn to practice consistency. Because consistency brings stability. Right? So you must learn to, you must learn to pray when it's going well. Uh, sometimes we pray the hardest when it's going difficult. But when it's going well, we pray the least. Right? And sometimes it can be the other way around. But if you want to be steady, if you don't want to be those who become tired and feeble and weak, right, you have to practice consistency. Right? I'm a, I used to be a tennis player, but I'm st I still like playing. So what happens is, is when I started again, I came from behind. I was unfit. So every time we pray, uh, not pray, play, right? Then for the, I'm praying and then my chest is burning. Hit another half an hour, chest is burning. Another half an hour, chest is burning. And if the point is long, I brand erg, right? You're like, you feel and you're like, just hang on, hang on, please, hang on, hang on. But then we went, then I did, what I did was I went for, Every week, I went twice a week, two hours, two and a half hours, playing, playing. And then, and then one, my, I think in the third month, when I came to the third month, I was playing, and it was after two hours. And all of a sudden, I was at that point, it was one long point, and my chest was burning like crazy. And, we, and, and I'm, a, I'm a guy who pushes. I don't like to, so I push and I play. And all of a sudden, my chest opened. Sure, just like, I was like, I've never been here before because I was always fit. Now I came from unfit and all of a sudden my chest opened and there was this breath, fresh breath that just hit me. And then I went and prayed for another 45 minutes after that, you know, and then I just had this energy that I got from nowhere, right? And then after I hit that peak, then I stopped playing for a while. And I came back, I was back to the same place. You can't, have, you want stability, you got to be consistent, right? If I want to keep that level of fitness, I have to be consistent in what I do, right? You want, some of us want spiritual fitness, but we lack the discipline and the devotion that is needed to keep that fitness, Right? You are not fit because, because it's all done by grace. Right? No. No. Right? There is, there is grace, but there's also labor. Right? There are things that God gives you freely, but you must labor by faith. And so if you labor with the right mindset, you will, the grace of God will work in your life and it will produce the spiritual maturity that you are looking for. Are you all with me? So the tired and the weary, the, the tired is the unsteady, those who are not steady in their walk, right? And, um, and many times uh, people have said to me, nee, my pastor blame was not so. So, <laughs> right? You don't see, I don't laugh too much, right? Or... Um, or you don't see me, dur da honor. I'm just like this the whole time. And then I say, no, but I'm happy, right? But there's a joy on the inside. It's my happiness. It's fine. You know, it's okay. I am like that. But there's a steadiness because there is a consistency. We just go day in, day out, day in. And guess what, brothers and sisters? That is not religious. That is not tradition. That is not... Nothing. That is what the Bible says. They devoted themselves, right? To doctrine, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayers. If you want to be stable, steady, firm, rooted, strong, you have to practice consistency day in, day out, day in, day out for the rest of your life. Right? For the rest of your life. Okay? Because you don't wait for the storm. 
You don't wait for the rain to fall, to build. You build your house upon the rock before the rain comes. Right? Wazi Bowers, you try to build in rain. As a chamosh. Right? It's difficult. It's not the right environment. Okay? And then we have the weary. The word for weary means faint. The definition for it is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. All the teachers here, you have permission to correct me. Uh, it's lang languid. L-A-N-G-U-I-D. Languid. Okay. So, it when you describe someone who's languid or weary in this scripture, right, you mean that they show little energy or interest and are very slow and casual in their movements. So, when you are part of a family, but you show little interest in what is happening and what is being done, right, you are those that become weary for this journey. Are you all with me? You lose interest. And what Am Amalek does is he attacks those who are losing interest. Right? Who are not really journeying themselves, devoting themselves to the culture. Not devoting themselves to the culture and they, those are the ones that are becoming weary they are the ones that become attacked by Amalekites. Are you all with me? Okay? So that's, what, that's how the Amalekites work. That's how they attack. Right? Then um, the word also for weary there is to be exhausted by labor um, so that it does not produce increase. Right? And then it says... Yeah, in the last part of the verse is, and it did not fear God, right? So where there's a lack of reverence for God and his word, right? They are people who open themselves for the attack by the Amalekites. Because when we do not reverence and have a high respect for the word of God and for God, for the things that he says, and we treat it lightly, Okay, then we open ourselves from the spirit, right? Because it's where there's a lack of fear for God, a lack of reverence for God, is where we go into all funny stuff and we are able to do things and just say, No, in God, in God there is grace for all the nonsense that I'm doing. But grace, right? Grace is. The freedom from sin. When the Bible says stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. It is not saying stand fast in the freedom to sin. It is saying you've been made free. Stand fast in that freedom. Right? And where there is no reverence for God. We are able to do things that sometimes not even in the world they would do. And where there's no fear for God, this is where we become, in a sense, we could become arrogant with practices of sin that is not supposed to be amongst us. Right? Are you all with me? Because the, the grace of God that has appeared brings to us salvation from sin, not a habit of sinning. And then say, there's grace for us. No. So, there, so the Amalekite lo loves to work with those who do not have this reverence for God. Right? And the reverence for the things of God. We are to be examples to the world. Right? Not, not they must look at us and say, us die. If that is how Christianity is, then I don't want it. Right? We must not be the reason why the world does not want to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. 
Our lives must be the reason why they say, no, I can see the change in you. I can see what God is doing in your life. Therefore, we want that also, right? And therefore, that is being a light. So we should not have this lack of reverence for God's word. Are you all with me? And you will know that when you are depressed and when you are downcast and feel discouraged, that's the time you think of drinking. That's the time you want to go into pornography. That's the time you want to sleep around. That's the time where thoughts come into your mind that you wouldn't usually think of, right? Because the Amalekite loves to attack when you are in that place and then bring new opportunities for you and drive you further into sin and bondage. But that is not what we should be doing. That's why the Bible says, watch and pray, right? Watch and pray. So brothers and sisters, this spirit seeks to take us further into sin. We cannot dilute what we have built over the years. We cannot make corrupt what we have built over the years, right? We didn't come here so that we could practice sin. We came here to this journey so that we could serve God, right? And that's why last week I said to you that unless you surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ, right? Too focused on Jesus as my Savior, but not the Lordship of Christ. The Lordship of Christ means I will obey Him, right? Regardless, regardless of how difficult it is, right? Uh, when the Lordship of Christ is in my life, is He can speak the things that I don't like to hear. Right? That's why the Bible says in the last days, many shall, many shall have itching ears. And in a day and age when we have Facebook, Twitter, we have Instagram, we have WhatsApp, we have YouTube, we have, you can pick and choose whatever preacher you like that will give you comfort. In concerning what you want to do. We have itching ears. We collect for us preachers that will agree with what we desire. Right? And so I, I heard a statement which I like. Um, and it's someone in our, in, our, in our part of, in this, you know, in this apostolic season. And they said, they said, love is not God. Can I say it again? Love is not God, but God is love. In other words, he defines love. Love does not define him. He tells you what love looks like. Right? Not you tell him how he must. And in the wilderness, we can develop our own concept of God and not have the real concept of who God is. Right? Develop our own image of God. Are you all with me? So this, this spirit, right? And today, God's fight is with Amalekites, not with you. Right? God's fight is with that spirit, but you have to know why it comes, how it comes. Are you all with me? Okay? So tell the person next to you, do not lose your reverence for God. Tell the other person on the other side. Can God tell you, can God speak to you things that are difficult? That is a question you must ask yourself. Because I guarantee you, the Lord does not only speak those things that are nice. As I said to you in the other sessions, one of my greatest breakthroughs was when God rebuked me. It brought one of, it was today, I still consider it as one of my greatest moments with God. It did so much for me. Right? And so, and that's why, and that's why we, we pray this way. When we have things that we want to say, Lord, give me confirmation. 
it, it's so strange. We always look for confirmation. We never say, Lord, your will. Which means, because when you pray for confirmation every time you want to do something, it means that the, you are just simply looking for confirmation. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are only looking for confirmation. You, and, so, and so if something comes that is kind of like in what is in your heart and what you want to do, is this maybe the Lord that's confirming? But it's far better to pray, what is your will? I have this in my heart. What is your will for me to do? Give me not my will, but your will. When Jesus was going to the cross, he did not pray for confirmation. He prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, my will is I want to run now from the cross. But not my will, your will be done. What is your will? He should have prayed, give me confirmation because I'm afraid. I'm, my, sorrow, my soul is full of sorrow. I feel a burdened and heavy. Right? We always say that if we feel sorrow and, it's, and we have this great amount of burden and so on upon us, then we say that cannot be the will of God. So Lord, just show me the confirmation that I must escape, leave, run, move. Right? But that is not what Jesus prayed for. He prayed for not my will, but your will. And the will of the Father was go through the cross to get to the other side, right? And so there, there must be in us a measure that we surrender to the Lordship of Christ. The Lordship of Christ. I remember 2016, I said to the Lord, when he, when he met me at that place, I said, Lord, it doesn't matter. You don't have to change anything. I'll, yeah, as long as you are with me, I'm getting up from here and I'm moving forward. Right? And brothers and sisters, nothing changed around me. Everything was still difficult. But I surrendered to his will. His will is what may us surrender to. Are you all with me? Are you all with me? Right? Don't pray for confirmation. Pray for his will. Pray is to find the will of God and is to and ready and you are ready to submit to that will, to his will. And if his will is, you know, leave, escape, you shouldn't submit to this pressure or whatever, then it's fine. But we are after his will, right? So that's why, brothers and sisters, I say to you, just because you are finding it, just because there is maybe a sorrow and you feel heavy, doesn't always mean that this is not the will of God. Because for Jesus, it was the will of God. The reason why he had that experience is because he did not yet surrender. It was the first time in his life as the son of God in recorded scripture where Jesus actually, his will, fought with the will of God. He many times said, I must go to the cross. He many times said, I'm the son of man must die. I came to give my life. All these things. When they were looking for him, except the son of, he said, except the corn of wheat falling to the ground and die, it abides alone. He was speaking concerning his death. Right? And we will create a weak Christianity. We will create a weak walk in Christ. If the only thing, if the only thing we can do is that which is nice and easy. And my soul feels blessed by it. But I cannot endure difficulty. I cannot, I cannot in that place of where it's difficult surrender to the will of God and go through. All right? For the Bible says, for no chastisement is joyful, but it's painful. But it produces the necessary fruit of holiness. There is some holiness that God will, can't give you. I, 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 I say this. There's some things God cannot give you humility. 
even though you have a partaker of that divine nature, it must be worked into you through difficult. The way and the way that you prove that you have humility is by having someone to submit to. That's the only way you can prove it because that is where you authenticate it. That's where you, you say, I have it. Right? And that's why in our journey in Christ, we come to places that, that nug on the areas in our heart that we have not yet dealt with. But that God seeks to deal with. Are you all with me? Are you all with me? Okay? So, we cannot only be after the nice words. Okay? Uh, but we're not, we are not primarily going to have the rough word every time. God speaks in general. He's a father. He's, but he also speaks when it's necessary. Right? I remember many, many years ago when, when the Lord, um, this is another other place of rebuke. When he rebuked me, then it was, and then the Lord said to me, those whom I love, I just as I rebuke. I remember feeling that love. And the tears ran down my face, and I said, thank you, Lord, that you love me, that you don't leave me in, my, in the state that I am in. I thanked him for it, right? And so we must not create in ourselves a situation where where everything that we hear is nice. And then when there comes one rebuke, then we are offended. When you get one rebuke from the brothers and sisters that are amongst you that are, that are more mature in the Lord, then there's an offense because we've created a culture that does not, that does not um, what's the word, accommodate in our hearts and a culture that does not accommodate rebuke. But we have a culture, we want that culture, where we can rebuke. Right? But it is not something we are going to do weekly. Okay? No, that is, that's destructive. But when need be, as we say, moet recht trek. Right? Do you, do you understand? Do not, do not allow the spirit of Amalekite to further build in you a lack of reverence for God. Okay? So, let's go back to Exodus 17 and verses 8. There's a scripture in the New Testament that says, He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain from evil. Right? So there is a practical side to our walk in grace that creates that we will love life and see good days. Right? I always mean. So Exodus 17, verse 8, now Amalek came. And fought with Israel. Now let's read verses, verses uh, 7. Because it, this is the word then. Right? Verses 7. It says, So we called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Remember, they came to a place where there was no provision, where there was a lack. And this brought strife into their hearts. But the word, the word there for, for Meribah means strife. So Meribah means strife, right? And contention. But their strife and their contention was with Moses and the Lord. Right? When there's strife and contention with leadership and, and there's a subtle, and there's a subtle uh, undermining of the instruction of leadership, right? Then this is where this is refidum, right? 
And when, when we look at these things, right, Meribah, contention of the children of Israel with leadership, you've led us to this place, you brought us here, and look how we are struggling and it's finding it difficult, right? And they had contention, an undermining of the leadership of Moses. And so if there, if there is in your heart anywhere where there is a slight battle with leadership or too opinionated with the things that we sometimes say or the instructions that we give because this is where you show your lack of reverence. Because when there's an instruction, that's okay, ons hoef dit te doen nie. That is a lack of reverence. You show your reverence for your husband when you, when you show respect and when there's an instruction sometimes that you do. Sometimes my wife and I have those conversations. Okay? Once is happy go lucky. Well, every once in a while I say, my vrou, I get you say, don't do it. That's all I want. Okay. Okay. I'm sure my wife doesn't have a problem with me saying that. <laughs> you anyway can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. When I go home, I can feel it. Sophia is there to prove it. <laughs> right. But my wife and I, we somehow have those conversations. Just, I ask you to do, just do it. That's all I want. Just do it. Don't give me all the reasons why we shouldn't. Okay? Maybe I know, but I'm not interested in that. I just want you to do it. That's it. Right? Now, now our reverence, right? Our, our strife and contention with leadership. Right? Brothers and sisters, when we say something, we must be followers. Okay? But we are, we are good followers when we have a, a surrendered heart to the Lordship of Christ. Right? I tell you, my spiritual father, uh, those of you who know him, he's not, he's not slow to give you a rebuke. So, Varok, if I walk around him, I'm not walking on all my, my whole feet. I'm walking on my toes. You know? Oh, he, he loves me. Um, but I, I, I know. I said, no, for Kirtun, he won't wait. Why? Because he's not someone who keeps things in his heart. I say it, net. Right? So, he is, and I have submitted to it. But he has... Uh, Corrected me once publicly in front of other people. I submitted to it. You cannot say you are humble. And yet, you cannot accept things like that. Because these are the things that show you are growing. Right? Not just your ability to prophesy better. And not just your ability to sing better or play better. Or, or preach better or those type of things in the gifts but when you can the, the character can be developed these are the hard things right are you all with me the Lord's fight is with the Amalekites okay the Lord's fight is with the Amalekites okay he called it Mary Ba. Let's read Judges 6, verses 3 and 4. I want to show you how the Amalekite come and work, right? Judges 6, verses 3 and 4. It says, So it was, whenever Israel, listen to this, whenever Israel had sown, they working their ground, they working their fields. They're working their business. They're sowing their seeds. 
they doing their thing. The Midianites came, would come up whenever. Then the Midianites would come up. Also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come against them. The next verse. Then they would, then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth. All the work and the labor that you're putting and plowing into your business or into the work that God has given to you. Say this one comes up and it destroys the produce, the product of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel. Neither sheep nor oxen nor donkey. They devoured their, their increase. Right? And the word Midianite means strife and contention. So the Amalekites come where there is strife and contention with each other and with leadership. It's to our disadvantage to have strife and contention. The Bible says where strife and contention is, there is every evil work. Whatever you want, let it happen. And for all of us, it will look different. If there's strife and contention in the marriage, every evil work is possible. If there's strife and contention amongst the people, every evil work is possible. Strife and contention at work, every evil work is possible. That's why your fight against the Midianite is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord your peace. You must have the ability to have peace. To fight strife. Are you with me? The revelation of God is, is what shows you because Gideon went and built an altar and he called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord my peace giver. The one who can give me peace so that no strife with someone can affect me. That's why the Bible says in marriage, in marriage it says wives, it says wives, do not adorn yourselves outwardly, but inwardly, with a meek and a quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. What does that mean? That means your ability to have peace. When... It's when, it's, when it comes your way, it's not peaceful. But you still have peace. Because a meek and a quiet spirit, it means my inner man has, is not warring on the inside. I remember Crystal was, when she got the prophecy, most of you were here when Crystal got the prophecy and, and, the, and uh, Kuba said to her, the Lord says, zip, it's time to zip it. It's time to muniprati. Oh, it was a war. The mouth was quiet, but in it was fuming. Say, how do I do this? I'm going to be quiet, but inside I'm ready to explode. I can, I can, I can tear this man apart because of what's happening on the inside here. Right? And later we were saying, no, it's not about being quiet here. This, you can only control this. If you can control this. If you can't control the inner man, you cannot control this. Right? That's why the Bible says, he that has a self-control, he that can control himself, is like a city that has walls. He keeps all the attacks out. Because inside the city, all the war is outside. Inside the city is peace. Peace internally. But you have to go to the giver of peace, Jesus, right? Who will able to give you peace, right? So wherever there is Midianite, strife and contention, the Amalekite pops up. And when there's strife and contention, that's when Amalekite says, go and do that. That's when the Amalekite leads you into things that you're not supposed to go into. 
You all know the temptation, the temptation is greater when there's strife and contention, when you are discouraged, downcast. That is when it's easiest to do the worst thing. Are you all with me? Right? So this is why, I was sharing yesterday with my wife, I said, this is why a, a, a word like order is so powerful. Because order is like a shield in the spirit. That's what it is. It's a shield. Order is that, is, is that powerful. You know, in a, um, before I gave my heart to Christ, my, my parents, we were the owners of two Kentuckys, the one in Ventuk and the one in Swakop. We were the owners, and then we were the owners also of Captain Derego when Vernil opened, if you're as old as I am. <laughs> right? I'll not cake for my sewer. Right? And when there was strife and contention and fighting in my in the marriage of my parents, we lost everything. Right? That's when a, it is in that period, that's when another relationship came into the, into the picture. Right? Because the Amalekites take an opportunity with strife and contention. Brothers and sisters, that strife and contention we must deal with quickly. Right? I'm not saying someone won't make you angry, but you must learn to deal with it quickly. You must learn to forgive quickly. You can't wait months. You must learn to deal quickly with the offense. Forgive quickly. How long are you sitting with the forgiveness, unforgiveness? How long are you going to hold the grudge? Can't. It, it suffocates grace. Makes you come short of grace, says the Bible. The Bible says many, by bitterness, come short of the grace of God. Scripture. In other words, the grace of God won't work. These are the practical things that mess us up. These are the practical things that... that Take us out of the picture. But there is grace available when there's repentance and alignment. Grace comes, restores, repositions, puts you back, and you move forward. Right? So that, that word for, for Meribah is strife and contention. If you have any strife with me, brothers and sisters, forgive and let go. Accept my leadership. That you must do. Accept my right to lead. That's what you must accept. It's my right. Okay? Then the word masa means to tempt. In Exodus 17, 7, Masa means to tempt. It was the questioning. You know, this is where we like to tempt the Lord. When things go difficult, ah, is the Lord with us? Where is he? You know, when things are going tough, that's the, con that's the talks that we have, right? If in Exodus, yeah, it says, is the Lord among us or not? That is a picture of their doubt that the Lord, if the Lord is with them. And now, brothers and sisters, it's when we doubt these things, is when we make decisions that are not in the will of God. That's true. It's true. After Jesus rose from the dead, Peter was called to do what? Be a fisher of 
Man, what did he do? He went to catch fish. Friend, where is the Lord now? He's, he's battling on the inside. And what does he do? He makes a decision to go catch fish instead of being a fisher of men. We, when we doubt and we are in that place, this is where we make decisions. Sometimes that, that, that affect us spiritually negatively. Because, and that's when we are not, that's when we don't continue in the will of God. So the, the Amalekite comes when this is what's happening with the people. Right? And he works in that environment. And we must not give him space. As the Bible says in Ephesians, give the enemy no place. That word place means a license, a spot. Right? To th say things and make you think in a way that is not correct. Right? When we doubt, we must understand the will of God for our lives. For example, many of you might be waiting for your husband or your wife. But when you start to doubt and the journey becomes too long, what do you do? That's when you are tempted to take matter into your own hands. When Sarah was waiting for the child and the child wasn't coming and the doubt started to creep in, she said, Abraham, Esau is Hagar. Take her, my friend, and produce us an heir. That's when we produce works in the flesh. That's when we produce things we're not supposed to be producing. We're doing things that have got nothing to do with us. We must understand the will of God or we make it the will of God. And Abraham said, yeah, okay. You were slept with Agam, produced Ishmael. Then Sarah became pregnant. Then she said, my world, what did I do? Now I've got an Ishmael here. When we doubt, we make decisions. When you doubt leadership, you make decisions that are not correct. Right? When you doubt what is, what you have learned. I have seen over the years, people who walked with God, not here. Now I'm being honest, not here. Just so we don't think here. But I've been in the past seeing people who walked with Christ. I gave my heart to the Lord. I got them in Christ. Strong, powerful, strong people. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, sleeping around with, an, with another, with a married man. And then saying, no, but the scriptures say, I said, you are twisting the scriptures. Because before this, you said, Yourself, this is wrong. We twist scriptures, right? When we enter into certain things, things happen, right? When we are in doubt, brothers and sisters, that is when you must be careful for making decisions that are not in agreement with God's will. Is when you when you doubt the issue that God uses leaders in church, in his church, that's when you are easy to make a decision, say, Moabite, what father? Hierdie father in goede, hierdie goede is moesie by die Heere nie. Is die goede? Nee man. When you once agreed, can you see the Amalekite the Amalekite exhausts you, tires you, makes you have situation after situation, takes the breath out of you, and just makes it difficult, right? But let's go to verses 9. How did they defeat it? Verse 
Verses 9, Exodus 17, verse 9. And Moses said to Joshua, choose some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. What does Moses do? He goes to the top of the hill. You know what the Hebrew word for top is? It means chief. It means head. It means summit. It means ruler. It means the chief amongst. What does Moses do? He establishes his leadership because they were in contention with him. In verses 2, Exodus 17 verses 2, the Bible says, And the people chided with Moses. They had a contention with Moses. And what does he do? His response to Amalek is to establish his position. You know, sometimes you don't have to fight with people. You just have to stand your ground. Right? He says, on the top of the hill with the rod of God in his hand. You know what the rod is? It's the authority that he has to lead. That's what the rod symbolizes. The rod symbolizes leadership. When they fought with Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and they, and they didn't want to accept their leadership, God said, let every man, the head of every family, let them all bring their rods. Put it before the tabernacle and the rod that buds is the rod that I choose amongst the people to lead. And Aaron's rod budded. Why? Because they fought with Aaron. And God said, I tell you, I lead by people. Right? The scriptures, the scriptures is, 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 is plain. He establishes his leadership. Okay? Verses 8. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Verses 10. Let's see verse 10. And Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. Amalek and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So Aaron and Hur is a picture of supportive leadership, of supporting leadership in what, is, in what needs to be done to accomplish the will of God. Read verses 11. Let me show you. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him. The Hebrew word for stone is eben, which is sun, sonship. So they took the sonship principle, Aaron and her, and they, because in father and son, submit, come under, support, right, accept. They took the sonship principle and they placed it under him, and in their sonship, they were saying, we are here to support. We follow, we move. Right? So what, does he, what is happening here? They are establishing order again. Because there was a contention between leadership and Moses and the Lord leading them. But they had to come. They, so they took the stone, put it under him, and he sat on it. Right? The word set there means it gives rest. Where the sons support, leadership also gets rest. And not only, but when that happens, the rest from Amalek also happens. Right? And on the other side, and his hands were steady until going down of the sun. So, the, that ability to to be able to apply the principle of sonship. All right? Give me James chapter 4 verse 6 to 7. They had to establish the stone under him so that their victory with Amalek could take place. You know, there's some battles that you will fight that you can't win until you come into order. You can rebuke and it's come back. Rebuke and it come back. Rebuke and, and it, you know, and, that's, and it's there that we say, Nehemiah, where in my past did I do what? No, because in the present, in the present, there's no order. Right? But he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
I am what I am by grace. You can't, you know, for example, like this is why when people have this concept that, that grace is almost like a license to sin. That's why that grace never changes you. Because grace is never a license to sin. The license to sin is called licentiousness or lasciviousness, which is in the book of Jude where it says they have exchanged grace for licentiousness, which means we have created a, a concept where we say a license to sin in our mind. We can sin freely and there's grace for us, right? But then you do not realize you've exchanged grace for something else. You are not in grace. Because if you were in grace, you would be receiving power to be saved. The grace that appears brings salvation. It does not, it does not make you worse. It empowers you. It reigns. When you are under grace, your sin will not reign over you. Sin will not have dominion over you. That's the power. Now he says, Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There are some things you will resist, rebuke, say, Right? That thing doesn't want to change. Why? Because first submit to God. And to submit to God, you have to, in your situation, what does the word of God say to you about your situation? Are you all with me? Okay. Resist. There are some things you cannot deal with until you come into order. Think about when Jesus went to Face the devil. Before he went to the devil, he went to John the Baptist. And it is from John the Baptist where he submitted to God and the instruction of God. And is there where he got authority to go into ministry. And when he did it, when he faced the devil, he had power to face the devil. If he skipped Josh, uh, uh, John the Baptist, he would have never been able to resist the devil. Because even Jesus is obedient to the practical side of the walk. Bible says he submitted to his parents and he grew. God gives grace to the humble. Right? What does it say on? What's the next verse? Draw near to God he, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, I don't want to give you that one. First Peter chapter 5. So I'm just speaking. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5. We are coming to a close now. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. So there's a submission in the, in the order. There's an order of relationship in elders and younger where there's submission. Then there, to one another, there is also a submissive side. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The exalting that you are looking for, the upward growth, comes from the ability to submit. When Jesus submitted to his parents, the Bible says, the child grew in stature. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you so in this place of having to submit and so on cast your cares to the lord verse 9 oh, sorry verse 8 be sober 
Be vigilant. You know, the time, that's the time when you, you don't kill like curry. That's the time where in, in spiritually it's like you are drinking. You, be sober. In other words, think lekker, man. You're not thinking right. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So, you're gonna, if you're going to have the devil, make sure you are submitting. Next verse, verse 9, resist him. So when the devil comes like a lion, resist him, right? Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world, but in the context, first explaining submission. Now when the devil comes, there is power to resist. Brothers, I want to say to you again, there are some things you can't deal with. You can... Take your authority in Christ. You can rebuke all you want and it will go, but it will just come back until you step into order. Until you step into order. Right? So, let's end off with Exodus 17 verses 16. Let's stand while we read this one. Exodus 17, verse 16. For he said, because the Lord has sworn and the Lord will have war. Maybe read verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner my banner and and the lord is my banner means in verse 16 for he said because the lord has sworn the lord will have war with amalek from generation to generation right the spirit that brings poverty that brings depression that brings exhaustion that makes you tired, that suffocates the spiritual life out of you, this one that gives you problem after problem after problem, this one that fights with you, depression, and makes you wonder and go into things that you're not supposed to go into, that spirit, the Lord says, I fight with it. I fight with it. All right? The Lord's fight is not with you, brothers and sisters. I know I'm speaking strong, but my fight is not with you. The Lord's fight is with the spirit. Because the Amalekite in the dweller of the valley, where did they feed? Where did they defeat the Amalekites in the valley? It is then that very place where you are struggling that the Lord will defeat him. Because while Moses was on the top, Joshua, that means salvation, savior, the salvation principles of Christ amongst the people will work when there is proper order. It will work when there is proper order. And the Lord is ready to war with that spirit on our behalf. Right? He's ready to fight that thing. To break it so that we will not have to go through that exhaustion. But we will go from strength to strength. From glory to glory. Right? So right now, if you need to. Make right, correct, strife and contention. If you need right now to determine in your heart, so forgive, let go, deal with it. Come into alignment right now. Deal with it. Close your eyes. Let's, let's just take a time of prayer. Just have a few, just talk with the Lord for a, for a while before we pray and come against the spirit of Amalek.
if you have undermined leadership, if you have undermined in your relationships, if there's issues and so on, where there is a lack of fear for God and His Word. Make right. Your anger does not justify your behavior. I can sense the Lord wants to do something. Settle it in your heart. Accept the leadership of the Lord, the rod of God. for you for the spirit of Amalek please come forward come forward and we are going to take authority we are going to use the rod of God We're going to take authority we are going to come forward lift up your hands open your hearts accept the authority Break it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, right now I take authority. I take authority as the head of this home, as the head of this home and this family. I use the rod. I rebuke the spirit of Amalek that is coming against your people, that is bringing exhaustion, that's fighting them in the field. I rebuke it. In Jesus' name. Right now we break the hold of that spirit. And I pray that the Lord, our banner, who wars against the spirit from generation to generation, will fight. Lord, I rebuke depression, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I rebuke discouragement and disheartenment in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, there where the enemy is at work in our lives, we take authority right now father we declare that it comes to an end this day right now in jesus name in jesus name come on just pray just pray just thank him oh yes lord yes lord i know the lord is working i know he's working we rebuke that father we rebuke that in the name of jesus father father we pray for order 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 strength we pray for grace more grace father grace that they will overcome and victorious in the name of jesus christ lord we pray that nothing will overcome your people we shall journey forward into the purposes of god we shall become stronger we shall become mightier we shall become mighty men and women of valor we shall become powerful people father we are raising up giants not weaklings father we are raising up people where their walk will be strong and firm and rooted and grounded father people that will that will take the enemy and use the enemy as a footstool in the name of jesus christ in the name of jesus father we declare this thing nullified we bind this thing right now 
it works in the name of Jesus oh Lord we thank you we thank you as we take authority in the mighty name of Jesus Christ Koraba shataraba shataraba city ribo shandaraba shotorobo city Lord we place grace upon your people grace grace upon your people Korama shataraba grace Lord grace Lord Oh Lord we bless everything that they are doing Orobo shataraba shata Yes korebo kosata Come on, just praise him. Just praise him. Orobo koshe terabo shataraba shiti. Era mashana na moshana na makata raba shiti. He and orobo shete. Lord, let bitterness, Lord, let it go in the name of Jesus. Lord, heal it right now. Bitterness, Father, heal it right now. Heal it right now, Father. Lord, go into the hearts of your people. Korobo shete rebe shete. Ki andana mashana na ma. Lord, we rebuke the voice of discouragement, even the spirit of suicide that wants to work in the minds of your people. The spirit of suicide, we rebuke that thing in Jesus' name, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I declare that the woman in this place, Lord, they shall find themselves a man. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as they wait upon you, Lord, they shall find someone in the in Jesus' name. Lord, relationships that have been broken, let them be restored in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for the balm of Gilead, Father, to come upon your people, Lord. Lord, that healing will take place emotionally and in their hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you. Facilitators, will you help just to pray personally? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Determine right now in your heart to become obedient. Obedient. We will give no place to this devil. 